The Holy Gospel today is from John 2, starting at the 13th verse. As I'm reading, you'll notice that many times the pronoun he is used, and I'm going to insert Jesus because sometimes we hear he all over and it's hard to know who is talking, so I will add Jesus, Jesus in. As well as uh, the Gospel of John does not have the best history in regards to its anti-Semitism. And so when the translation of the Jews comes, and we're using the New Revised Standard Version, you're going to hear me say the Jewish people. I'm talking about those who collectively came, who are part of the tradition as they came to the Torah to worship God. Um, but uh, this, um, the Gospel of John has a very interesting history that we can have a class on later. But when you hear, you'll notice it will say Jew, the Jews, but I will be saying the Jewish people. The Passover of the Jewish people was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple. Jesus found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. Jesus also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jewish people then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And, they, and then they said, well, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from the triune God, creator, liberator, and sustainer of all life. Amen. I invite you, as you feel comfortable, to close your eyes and create a mental picture of Jesus. So, your own image, imagination of Jesus. And as you're doing this in your mind's eye, I'd like you to notice a few things. Is Jesus smiling? Serious? Where is Jesus? Is Jesus looking at you? Is Jesus active or still? Hold on to this image. And we'll revisit it later on. I invite you to come back to our collective when I was little, the image of Jesus that I had, whether I was closing my eyes or having them open, was a picture that was created by Warner Salmon in 1940. It is this picture. Has anyone ever seen it? Oh, yes. It has been reproduced 500 million times. Half a billion times, this has been reproduced all around the world. During World War II, these little pocket Jesuses were given to every single soldier, so Jesus would go with them as they went into war. After World War II, there was a national campaign to have this image of Jesus in every public and private sphere. So I grew up with this Jesus in my Sunday school classroom, and this Jesus, when I would go and visit Grandma, white Jesus was everywhere. And this Jesus has flowing hair, a passive, gentle spirit about him, ordered, looking serene, as if every bone in his body is non-anxious and non-confrontational. Without saying a word, this one-dimensional, whitewashed, domesticated image of Jesus, it stunted and distorted my understanding of Jesus. And it has taken me years to unlearn and disentangle this kind of archetype of Jesus who promoted more of a consumer-driven savior who was really interested in more of a personal salvation rather than a collective liberation. 
We now believe and we know, and we have talked about this since I've arrived here at St. Matthew's uh, many years ago, is that Jesus, we know, it was brown-skinned and brown-eyed, Palestinian, a refugee born in an occupied land, and he looked possibly like this. But this is not the Jesus that usually we see. Jesus was a healer, a liberator, a teacher, a spiritual guide. He operated with an egalitarian core, believing that the kinship of God was intended for all humans, men and women, children and elders, lepers and lost souls, strangers and the most vulnerable in society. And we can take that down. In scripture, and we saw that displayed with our kiddos, with all of the emotions, but in the scriptures, Jesus offers a full range of human emotions. Jesus is frustrated when the disciples do not understand what he is teaching. Jesus weeps at the loss of innocent life. Jesus grows weary and exhausted and goes off onto a mountain or some place to just rest for a little while. And ultimately, Jesus cried out from the cross in utter despair, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he dies and breathes his last. And in our gospel text today, Jesus snaps. He gets angry. He gets so angry. And we don't spend much time with Jesus' anger. Instead, we have oftentimes the images like the one I grew up with, or one that is very sterile and still. But Jesus becomes unhinged, rages at a normalized legal system that exploits the poor and capitalizes upon religious duty. In a frenzy of unbridled righteous anger, Jesus takes a long cord and drives out the animals that are being sold for sacrifices, turns over the tables, destroys property of merchants and money changers. I mean, Jesus screams. Jesus accuses. Jesus does not want just reforming or a cleansing of the temple practices. He wants all corruption to cease. Now, it was customary during this time for pilgrims every year to make their way to Jerusalem. And when you would go, you would give a sacrifice. If um, you were wealthy, you would have goats or lambs or cattle. And if you were a peasant, you could purchase inexpensive doves for maybe just two days worth of wages. Now, you could maybe bring a goat from home, but I mean, sometimes it can be really hard to travel with an animal that maybe isn't used to long distances. And when you get there, you would have to present your animal to the priest. And if the priest said that the, the animal was not pure or religiously clean, you'd still have to go into the outer court and you'd have to buy an animal. So sometimes it's probably just easier to just buy the animal right there at the temple. And so... When you are ready to buy your animal for the sacrifice, you, can't, you, you will take your Roman coins and then you will exchange it for a temple coin or coinage because you could not in the temple use the Roman coin because the Roman coin had the image of Caesar who believed himself to be God and we just read the Ten Commandments and you cannot have any other gods before me, right? So in the temple they would switch it over and the money changers then would then give you coinage that could be used in the temple. But they could easily and often would add a percentage for their own, they were making money. And then those who were selling who had kind of like, they had the market, they were the ones who were official folks to sell their livestock at the, um, at the temple, well, they were able to make a profit too. So at every level, folks were making money in God's house. And you could see that the faithful pilgrim was a victim of economic exploitation, caught in an abusive and oppressive system that served the rich and those who had power and access, 
and it took advantage of the poor and the vulnerable. So what does Jesus do? He loses it. I love it. He rages against the system because bodies are at stake and like spiritual health is at stake. And Jesus is not just going to sit off in the corner and he's going to pray because the very health of the whole system is at stake for Jesus. Because Jesus, he knows that people are coming here to the temple because it's believed that the temple is where God resides. And people are coming here to connect with God. And there is, there is barrier after barrier after barrier for people to come and just have communion with God. And so Jesus, he gets angry. Now, it, we need to remember that it's not as if he walked in and all of a sudden was surprised and snaps. But Jesus had grown up with this. He had been watching this for years and years. His family had gone. He probably knew family and relatives who would scrape enough money to be able to go in and to make sure that they could buy a couple of doves or maybe this year they could buy a sheep. And so Jesus, he had traveled with his family. He had watched the money changers selling all of the animals. This was not new to him. I often think that really this frustration, this anger was kind of like cooking in him. Does that ever happen to you? Or you've been seeing something, maybe you see some injustice that's happening at work, and it builds, and it builds, and then finally, someday, you send the email that's rather curt and real, or you, or you have a conversation with someone, and you tell them exactly what you are seeing. This is a moment where Jesus finally boils over because he is seeing the injustice of what is going on. Now, in the, what's, what's fascinating is if we were reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the cleansing of the temple, the story that we read, they happen right before Jesus is going to be arrested, before Jesus is going to be tried with this unjust trial, tortured, and then executed on the cross. It's kind of like the breaking point. It's when all of the religious leaders and those in power are like, we are done with him. And they really make sure to organize and orchestrate his um, coming to his execution. But in the Gospel of John, it's in chapter 2. This is Jesus' first public act of ministry. At the beginning of John 2, Jesus goes to a wedding. He turns water into wine. He keeps the party going. And then he cleanses the temple. The Gospel of John lets us know that for Jesus, it's not like he needed to slowly get up momentum to proclaim who he was. This was an outright declaration of who God was in Jesus and caring for all bodies, and it was public, and it was that which was going to unearth every kind of system that exists, religious, political, social. Jesus wanted to bring holistic revolution, holistic care to every person and every body, because for Jesus, it was about people's souls. He cared about people's souls and for them to be liberated in body and mind and spirit. But I don't know you, it's really hard to feel liberated when you are feeling pinched by the economy. It's really hard to feel liberated when you have barrier and barrier put in your way for you to finally just thrive. And Jesus sees this. He does not look away and he starts to flip over the tables. Anger. Anger is something that when I was growing up, it was never to be used or talked about in faith. Like faith, we never talked about it. I grew up in the church, and if anyone was angry, they, it, was, it was their problem. And they needed to maybe pray a little bit more. Like we're to be about peace and comfort, and some of the marks of white supremacy are that we always have comfort, that we're individual, and we want everything to remain the same and status quo. I learned that, and I have been slowly having to unform that, and it was a therapist. Oh, 
my goodness, 15 years ago, and I was telling her about something that was happening in the church, and she said, and I wasn't as charged, I was telling her, and it's really unfortunate. You know, I was using words like, it's unfortunate, it's, it's just really, it's just sad, and she goes, I think you're angry. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm not angry. And she's like, no, 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 I think you're angry. I said, no, I am, I am not angry. And she prodded me and prodded me, and all of a sudden, woof, I realized I had anger. And it actually had been stuffed down so deep that I had not let it come out and actually start to inform my life and my faith in a way that actually would move me toward action. Anger. Anger is good and holy, and we within the life of the church need to continue to remember that God works through righteous rage and anger. Our um, book study, I'm so thankful that Amanda and Bobby are leading the book study on the beautiful book, Our Unforming. I cannot recommend this book more. Uh, it is just a lovely book. And in it, on page 133, Cynthia writes this. To repair and restore our social disharmony, we need a spiritual practice of anger. Desert Father Isaiah Soltari believed that we need anger in our prayers. He writes, without anger, a man cannot attain purity. He has to feel angry with all that is sown in him by the enemy. BIPOC communities need to be angry with all that has been stolen from us. That anger is a part of the holy and sacred work of unforming. Creator of Black Liturgies, Cole Arthur Riley writes, Holy anger is that which liberates. It marches, chants, and flips tables, demanding wrong to be called by its rightful name. It is both passion and calculation. Longing for more, but for the sake of justice and dignity. Anger is the only spiritual practice powerful enough to disarm our collective and systemic sins. Because we need to hate these sins in order to undo the social disharmony they cause. For the oppressed, God's anger in the scriptures is comforting. God's anger demonstrates that God is not indifferent to our suffering. God's anger, Jesus' anger, demonstrates that God is not indifferent to our suffering. For those in this room today who are angry at cancer, God is not indifferent to your anger. For those of you today who are angry at the injustices that are going on in the world. Let me tell you, I have been hot this week as I continue to read what is coming out of Gaza. Over 30,000 lives lost, 71,000 people are injured, and children are dying of malnutrition. God is not indifferent to the suffering of the Palestinians. For those who have experienced in your bodies racial harm or prejudice, God is not indifferent to your pain and your suffering. For those who have experienced alienation or heartache or pain or a loss of a job, God is not indifferent to your suffering. Anger. Anger is okay when we realize that it's actually grounded in the bedrock of love. Jesus isn't angry just to get angry and pop off his top. He's angry because there are bodies at stake, people and lives, and his body is wrapped up in their bodies. Like, bodies matter, people matter, you matter, your body matters to God. And Jesus gets angry. God gets angry when harm comes to any of God's beloved. And there is this like, what is the word? It's poke, nudge, shove for the church to finally let loose at times our anger. Because anger will help spur 
us along to finally move and act and acknowledge, to continue to work toward that which will be a collective new world, a new reality where all might thrive. So what are you angry about? Like, if Jesus were here today and you could say, I am angry about the lack of mental health for folks today. I am angry at our economy where the rich are getting richer and all of us who are trying to survive, it is hard to pay our taxes in King County. What gets you angry? You now have a moment to actually live it. I invite you to find a friendly looking stranger and tell them what you are currently angry about. Ready, go, move, talk, share. Make it happen, people. Get up, make it happen. Talk to each other. Let your anger out. Let your anger out. Thirty seven seconds. invite you to come back from your conversations. I'd love for you to take a moment and go back to that image you had of Jesus. And then what you're angry about. Do they connect? Are they dissonant? How maybe are your image of Jesus need to shift and change and maybe be three-dimensional, be animated, be that which is so much more than sometimes the still image that we have of Jesus. When Jesus enters the temple and he turns over the tables, he is reminding everyone there that God does not live in the binaries of us and them. And those who can afford a sacrifice and those who dan can't or can and can't does not live in the binaries again of us or them, but instead creates an us that all are invited to come and to worship and to be in relationship with God. And the boundaries that are created are arbitrary and not God's heart. May God stoke your righteous and holy anger. May it continue to be grounded in deep love. 
And may you speak when you are called to speak and act when you're called to act and write your letter or your email when you're supposed to write your letter or your email. And may you not live in apathy or be an observer, but instead be a disciple. That's the one who follows Jesus and flips over the tables because of love. Let us pray. Holy, most gracious God, help us not be afraid of anger, to be afraid of our emotions. So many of us have been formed in a spirituality that was just trying to be about conformity and status quo, but continue to soften us and move us, our hearts, so we might be an embodied, living expression of your radical love. Pray that your Holy Spirit pours down on St. Matthew's and in our neighborhood and our communities, and you might call us each and every day to respond with this deep love, this deep, deep call. We pray all this in your most holy and blessed name for you are Alpha and Omega, your beginning and end. You're our life, our breath, our meaning, and our ultimate home. Amen.